in democracies as well, decisions are made by people to turn up, and I've got great respect for the people that spend their Tuesday nights or Wednesday nights or Thursday nights, depending on which community council is getting active and getting involved and participating in the debate. And uh, but we find, particularly in opposition, that the community councils are a very important resource for us because you've got the uh, the information, the local knowledge that then feeds through to us. We don't always agree with what you're, you're saying, but it, it's a very useful contribution to the debate, and I thank you for it. Uh, well, I thought this evening what I'd do is just go through uh, a short uh, summation of uh, my priorities for Canberra, uh, so you have a sense of the direction I'm taking, then really open it up for questions, and I'm happy to talk about any topic, you know, there has been a bit going on in the Liberal Party of the last 24 hours, you may have, you may have noticed, yeah, 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 extraordinary, isn't it? I think I've still got my job, but, you know, the, night, the night's about young, isn't it? So you, you never quite know. Um, have you been called to uh, the, the Hill to fill a vacant position? Not yet, no. no, 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 no. I'm, I'm quite happy where I am, I'm sitting the bloodbath up there, I'm very happy, very happy where I am, thank you very much. But, well, I think in many, in many ways next year is going to be a bit of a crossroads for the ACT. The government's been around for a long time and there's no doubt that the impact of whatever result happens next year will have impact for, for decades to come because the, the one alternative through the current government will be a future where essentially every available dollar is going to be spent on tram network. The tram from Civic to Gingalan is phase one of their plan to roll this out across Canberra uh, that is many, many billions of dollars and with a budget in deficit, in debt, at record levels, it means that most available dollars are going on a tram. So whether you like that or not, that's the reality of the situation. And as part of that uh, program of tax reform as well, we will see rates triple uh, or more. So that's going to be one future. Uh, and I think you know, out of that there'll be winners. Uh, the International Consortium, certainly. They'll be big winners, they'll be licking their lips. Uh, but there'll be a lot of losers, and certainly, from my perspective, there will be a lot of Canberrans left behind in that future. And I, with a, an alternative path, we obviously won't be doing the tram. I believe that Alistair Coe was here and gave you a presentation. Yeah. Uh, so we'll talk about that a bit later, if you like. But I do believe that there are a lot of people who've been neglected by this government, who've been left behind, and uh, affordability is a massive issue, particularly when it comes to rates and other uh, household uh, charges. Uh, so be it, you know, homeowners or tradies, uh, business owners, people waiting in ED longer than anywhere else in Australia, uh, we have a situation where, you know, people are left behind. And what I want to do is see a Canberra where it's more about all of Canberra, not just people that happen to live within 3Ks or, you know, of a well, not three k's, and three percent that live uh, within walking distance of the tram. Uh, but you know, I don't want to paint a negative picture because I do think that Canberra is a place of great opportunity and great potential. Uh, we really do have, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with me, being Canberrans, a wonderful city here. Uh, and really, my desire is, uh, if I do become chief minister, is just to give so many smart, creative, energetic people in Canberra the opportunity. And that's through, you know, government policies that help people, but also, in, you know, in my view, getting out of the way of people as well. I think that sometimes there is too much government in people's lives and, you know, particularly in business, uh, less interference in people's lives and uh, what they're trying to achieve uh, would possibly uh, be a good thing. Now, I, it's impossible for me and, you know, I, well, I'd, I'd love to, but we don't have time tonight to go through everything. Uh, but what I do want to do is define some very clear outcomes of what I would like to achieve uh, if I am a Chief Minister, and this is informed by I've been a parliamentarian for seven years now, and we've spent a lot of time out and about in the community, listening to people, understanding their priorities, and we have developed a, uh, and it's not finalised yet, all of it, but a, a very comprehensive plan and set of initiatives across all the portfolios, but there are three real outcomes that I consider critical if we're going to realise Canberra's potential. Uh, and the first is to grow the economy, uh, the second is to build the city, and the third is to fix the health system. Now, that's not to say that that's all there is to do, but if we don't get that done, uh, if we don't grow the economy, which provides the, uh, the potential for growth, and growth and is actually the, 
than the revenue to fund the, the health system and education. We're not going to be able to do what we want to do. Uh, building the city, and I don't just mean the CBD, but I mean our town centres and what we do in our suburbs, is vital. It's the urban space in which we live. Uh, and fixing the health system, it's now about a third of the budget. It's growing in, uh, in terms of its cost every day at extraordinary rates. We've got to get it under control and we've got to deliver a better service for the $1.4 billion <coughs> of your money that's spent on it. So I can just go to the first one in terms of the economy. Uh, I really do see great social benefits from growing an economy. It's not so that people can get rich. Uh, it is so that through a growing economy, people have employment, which I think we'd all understand the social benefits of. But if we've got a strong, vibrant economy, then we've got balanced budgets, then we can invest in health, in education, in infrastructure, the things that really matter to growing a city. Uh, and I see business as a very important part of that. Uh, I am, uh, as a Liberal, you probably wouldn't be surprised, uh, keen to see business grow in this town. I think that we have amazing potential. Some of the bigger sectors, the ICT sector, uh, the education sector with its export capability and potential. We've got so many smart people in this town. You know, CSIRO, the uh, ANU, John Curtin School of Medical Research, the potential is almost limitless, but also small business. Uh, I do believe that small business is still uh, a big driver of our economy and is quite agile, and it just needs, in some ways, the shackles to be taken off to grow and to, uh, you know, so many micro-businesses out there to employ more people. Um, so we do have that as a big focus in terms of uh, trying to get the tax levers right and regulation right so that the business can thrive. The second, as I said, was to build the city uh, and create the new infrastructure and revitalise the existing infrastructure uh, across our city. Because, you know, this is our built environment. This is where we live. This is where we raise our families. This is where we go to work. Uh, it, it is so important, as a, and as a Chief Minister, that's a big part of uh, anybody's or any Chief Minister's uh, role. But I, I do see that, again, the private sector has a big role in that. Uh, it has to be regulated, it has to be planned, uh, but I do believe that uh, we need to take some of the shackles off uh, when it comes to particularly some of the planning regulation, which is very convoluted, uh, very uh, sort of central planning, and a number of the, uh, the taxes that uh, occur. So for a job, you might have seen that we said that we would get rid of lease variation charge in the town centres uh, and the city. Uh, the reason is, I don't know if you're aware of what the lease variation charge is, but basically, if you have a lease for a commercial property and you want to make that a residential property, there's a massive tax to do that. Now, the problem is there are all these red, uh, commercial buildings vacant throughout the town centre and throughout the city centre that are just decaying. Uh, and if you want to turn them into residential, if you want to get the density, get the population into the city centre and the town centres, then developers just are not going to uh, invest, build and create in civic when there's a $50,000 tax per unit to do so. And what's happening is that they're going to Melbourne and they're going to Sydney and as a result, you go and have a look in civic. There's no cranes in the sky. There's no building. And if there's no building, that means you're not getting people into the, the <coughs> town centre. Go for a wander through Garima Place. It's, a, it's deserted. Uh, you don't get the vibrancy. You don't get the activity. Uh, and you don't get the jobs. You don't get the economic activity. It's all heading off to the Melbourne and elsewhere, and you get these perverse planning outcomes where there's no work happening in the town centres and civic, but the LDA is telling everybody to build units out at Wright and Coombs and Denver Prospect. Now, it's illogical to me that there's all this density happening out there when we're not getting the, the infill in the, uh, the town centre and civic where it needs to be. And I believe also that, you know, we've got to make sure that that is where the, the density is because I do want to see, as suburbs, you know, renew and, uh, and, and grow, that they keep their character. I think it's a very important part. It's a wonderful city that we live in. You know, the inner north in particular, I think, uh, has got that leafy characteristic, that open space. We want to keep that. So let's make sure the density goes where it is. So that's one of those very important policies uh, that we've brought out just recently. Uh, I think that 
the, uh, the corridors and the major corridors. Uh, there is development that can happen there. And I've, I don't know if you've read some of the stuff that David Hughes has written uh, in response to the tram. He's an economist that did major project review for the ACT government. And his view was the tram needs development. Development doesn't need the tram. You know, we can do some wonderful things along the Northbourne. You don't need a tram to do it. Uh, and we will do some great things uh, along the way. And uh, as I said, the third thing is to fix the health system. Uh, and that is an absolute priority. I've been the Shadow Health Minister now for seven years. Uh, it is a absolute fundamental uh, area of service delivery that any government must address. Uh, and there is so much, again, potential. Uh, you know, you've got some of the the great staff that we have, both nursing and medical staff and allied health. We've got the nursing schools at the Catholic University and at the University of Canberra. We've got the medical school at ANU. We've got the John Curtin School of Medical Research. There's no reason why we shouldn't have the best health system in Australia. But you wait longer for emergency treatment than anyone. Uh, our hospitals cost more. Our two hospitals in Canberra are the two most expensive hospitals in Australia. Now, I've got no problems with investing in health, but I want to make sure that we're not spending money where we don't need to. I want to reinvest it so we've got more nurses, more doctors, uh, spending tens, literally tens, if not hundreds of millions more compared to peer hospitals elsewhere. It doesn't stack up for me. Uh, so there's a lot we want to do in health, and as a start, we will build the 200-bed subacute hospital uh, in Belconnen, the University of Canberra, and we'll build it in 200 beds. The government's already cut 60 beds out of that. It's very short-sighted when we have the Canberra Hospital, which has got beds that are so full, the bed occupancy rate, uh, that is the number of beds are filled, is often at close to 100%. And the AMA says anything above 85% is dangerous. And we have the head of ED saying, this hospital, the number of, uh, the number of people in it, it's dangerous. Uh, that's just unacceptable. Uh, and we will have, you know, obviously more announcements to come uh, in those areas. So it's not to say that there's not a lot of other priorities, be it in education, environment, uh, and so on. But they're, they're three key priorities that I think that we must address. Because if we don't get that right, then it's going to be very difficult to do everything else that we want to do uh, in this great city of arms. Now I am more focused on what we'll do uh, rather than what we won't do. But there are two key issues that I think enable a lot of that. The first one is the tram, and I know that Alistair presented, as I said before, on the tram, uh, but ultimately it's the opportunity cost of a tram, a billion dollars. A billion dollars on a tram that services about 3% of the population, and according to the government's own figures, which I think is somewhat optimistic, uh, we'll only get an additional 400 people onto public transport, uh, with a benefit cost ratio that is marginal uh, and the jobs argument being put forward currently by the union is just not true. Uh, it doesn't create 3,500 jobs. It's 1,900 and it's only for the duration of construction and after the construction is finished, it's 75 jobs. Uh, and the reality is as well that if, you know, if I, I dare any of you to go out and spend a billion dollars, I reckon you could create more than 75 jobs. Uh, you'd have to work hard not to, to be, to be honest. There's, there's many higher priorities, and that's the point. There's no philosophical objection to trams. It simply doesn't work in Canberra because of our population density. Uh, the other issue then is rates. I have real concerns with the rates tripling in this town, and they are. There was a debate at the last election. Mike, you'd remember this. You've been out on the campaign hustings before, but there were, you know, are our rates tripling or not? You've all got your rates notice. You've seen that they've gone up 10% a year on average. 10% uh, a year, you tripled in 11.6 years. Uh, it's more for some suburbs, and particularly in the north, mm -hmm. probably going up at more than 10%. Now, that's just the start of it, because Andrew Barr said he's going to get rid of stamp duty and put it onto your rates. Mm -hmm. Now, there is currently $230 million of revenue being collected by the government in stamp duty, and that's actually going up. So it goes up to $260 million a year. So the government's saying they're getting rid of stamp duty. There's still $230 million, and it goes up by the end of the budget papers that we've got. By 2018, that is $260 million of revenue, of taxation, that is about to go onto your rates. So if you think your rates are high now, 
they're going to keep going up and up and up because not only are they going up by the normal amount of rates go up, there's $260 million to put onto your rates. And I just don't think that's fair. Uh, it, it just isn't equitable. And for a lot of people living in homes that notionally are worth, you know, they're, they're you know, a, a value, be it five hundred thousand, six, seven. A lot of people are on lower incomes. And if your income is your retiree is going up at 2% and your rates are going up beyond 10%, you know, you, you don't have to be a mathematician to work out that that is simply unsustainable. So, uh, look, there is a lot that we'll do. We have made policy announcements already about road duplications, about hospital beds, about buses, super express buses throughout the suburbs. Uh, and we'll be making a, a lot more announcements. But as I said, they are the three key priorities uh, that I have, is to grow the economy, to build the city, to fix the health system, and to have a, you know, a, a, a Canberra that is for all Canberrans, not just for the winners. Uh, uh, we really want to focus on those people, uh, many of them who have been left behind over the last uh, 14 years. So there's a lot to be done. Uh, we've got an election coming up next year, uh, and you know, we're, we're pretty excited about it, I have to say. Uh, I think elections are good, and it's good for everyone to participate in the democratic process. Uh, and we're very keen to hear from you. We want to make sure that if we go into the election next year with policies, that they're the policies that you can nod your head at. You know, you're not going to agree on everything, but if we're not delivering what matters to the people, then we've lost touch, we're out of, you know, we're out of touch. Uh, so we do want to listen to what you've got to say as well. It's not just about transmit, there's got to be a lot of us listening. Well. I'll leave it there, uh, but I'm very happy to take questions on, on any topic. Okay, open <coughs> for questions. Um, Go ahead. John Conkine. Um, hey John. Uh, sorry I was a bit late, but you, sure. you were talking about um, change abuse charges. Mm -hmm. Are you only looking at the, the town centres? I do building commercial mm. in here yep. in Fishwick, mm. and we have extension of time fees also, yep. which are absolutely massive, going yep. into six figures, yep. and also change of use charges. Are you going to look at them? Yeah, we are. Everyone, or we, no? we, what we've, we've done is we've said it goes to zero in the town centres, um, so, and a lot of that is about trying to send a very strong signal uh, that we do want economic activity and densification in the town centres and so. Uh, we have concerns with the lease variation charge across the town uh, and we will have more statements to make in the lead up to the election. Uh, I don't necessarily anticipate that we'd be getting rid of LVC across the whole town, uh, but we will have more statements to say. And in terms of the, uh, the extension of time stuff, that's, that is a problem too. This is where, if you don't build within a certain period of time, there are massive fees applied to it. And there are people who, you know, in... <coughs> Some of the commercial areas, see Hume, Fishwick, and so on, bought land with ex you know, you know they, they didn't do it just to leave it vacant. They were planning to build, they are planning to do things, but the GFC hit, things changed, they couldn't then build, they couldn't do things. And there are now people that their fines are as much <coughs> as they paid originally for the land. And they're just going to walk away. And more. Some are more. Some are more. So it, yeah. it's an incredibly punitive. Uh, and unfair, uh, and look, we're, we're, we're intimately ac across those issues. As I said, you know, we're still 14 or 13 months out from the election, and still a long way to go. We will have a lot of announcements to come, and uh, we will be talking more about extension of time and lease variation. Um, Labor plans to have all the trees gone out of Northbourne Avenue before the election. Mm. Is there anything you can do? Well, as you know, we don't want light rail to proceed. Uh, we have voted on a number of occasions in the Assembly to stop it. Uh, the government has brought in uh, a major project facil facilitation legislation to basically stop uh, objections. Uh, I think what I would say is I, I would encourage the community to get active. Uh, we are doing our bit. Uh, we do not want the trees being chopped down in Northbourne, uh, and all of the changes that are going to happen there, which will be negative. Uh, what I would say is get active, get involved as well. Um, so we will continue to, to fight the fight. Uh, we are looking at legal avenues, uh, but there's only so much we can do with 
the numbers that we've got in the Assembly. Ultimately, uh, I don't think that the government's going to go and chop down all the trees before the election. It would be pretty bold of them to do so uh, because of the outrage it would cause. So they're probably, maybe, they'll wait until after the election. The timelines aren't exactly clear. So mm. ultimately, we will stop this. We will stop this if we're in government, but we just need to be in government. Some are already gone. It seems to be a gradual process. But I, the disease one's first, and then... Yeah, but how much of them... Well, we can accept disease, but not chopping 300 <coughs> trees in. But how much is disease? Because there were reports that said these trees are good for many years to cut, and then once light rail came on the picture, then it was, oh, no, 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 they're all diseased, we've got, we've got to get rid of them. So uh, I think there are a few myths there, but, you know, I, I hope that there's no large scale coming down the trees. And this is, this is part of the point where we said, well, take it to the election, and if you get the mandate... That's the way politics works. That's the way that democracy works. And I think this is where a lot of people are pretty upset uh, because they don't believe the government's got the mandate for light rail. Mm -hmm. Now, any major project, there's arguments for, there's arguments against. Um, and let's have that debate. And if the government is able to convince the population this is the best way to spend a billion dollars of their money, well, th that will be the outcome and they will have the mandate. But to do this without the support of the population. And it is clear, talking to most people, that people do not believe that they have their say on lot right. Um, in light of that, um, what is the Liberals' policy on Mr Fluffy, given that without a mandate they have gone and spent a billion dollars? Um, we just want to get a better understanding of the Liberals' policy yep. on that, if any changes would be made to yep. the current implementation. Well, we um, referred this to a committee of the Assembly and the committee, which was a bipartisan committee, uh, brought down a report, uh, it was a pretty quick one, but we heard from Mr Fluffy homeowners, and we, the committee then I think had 60 recommendations, uh, and then we, when the, the bill was put through the Assembly, we called for a number of changes to it, uh, to the, the government's legislation, to, to make it in many ways fairer for homeowners, uh, for people affected by uh, Mr Fluffy. And we, we spoke to, I've spoken to dozens of people. I've had many people in my office crying. It's been, it's been a very emotional journey for people who've been affected uh, by Mr Fluffy. It's just been awful. I remember the, I remember back with a letter that came out that was just addressed to the householder that was sent out on the 18th of February last year. I remember when it all came out in the media, I sort of said to my wife, did we get one? Because you just get letters in the mail, it's just an extraordinarily bad way to do it. Uh, it could have been managed a lot better. But we, we have brought forward a number of changes. I think that, you know, things like older people living in their homes have been there for 30 or 40 years, and if people are in their 70s or 80s, to say then you're going to be evicted, essentially. Now, people are part of a community, be it in Western Creek or the inner north or wherever, but to say then, you're out, where do those people go? Because there's no way that they can, you know, knock, uh, see the property knocked down. They probably won't be able to buy that property back because uh, they won't be able to afford to and then rebuild. It's just not realistic. And then when, when they're looking now for alternate properties, trying to then buy back into the Indian North or buy back into Western Creek or whatever, they can't afford to do it. They find themselves dislocated from their communities. So there's a, there's a sort of two sides of it. One is the the impact on the Mr Fluffy homeowners, uh, and there are a number of changes that we've called for. And the other is then the planning impact of uh, the uh, unit titling uh, that we have raised concerns with as well, because it seems that we're going to have planning outcomes in our suburbs, which is ad hoc. One rule for the government, another for a private citizen, uh, and you know whether a property is unit titled or not is based on whether it's a Mr Fluffy home rather than whether it's appropriate to be a unit title. So that's now being referred to committee on variation 343. That's being looked at, but we do have some pretty significant concerns with that's been, where, where that's been rolled out as well. But, and, sorry. So, and we've also called for a board of inquiry okay. uh, because, you know, there's a, there was a lot known by people. There's a lot of information out there. And look, you know, it, it's not about a witch hunt, but when you have something, a disaster that's cost the community hundreds of millions of dollars that have potentially exposed thousands of people to uh, mesothelioma uh, 
that has caused so much trauma and heartache and is now going to have an impact in terms of planning and so on. If you don't have a board of inquiry into this, I'm not sure what we have a board of inquiry into. Uh, I don't know why we'd ever have a board of inquiry if you don't look into this. Now, we are then seeing where we land in terms of a lot of this, what eventuates in terms of developing our policy to take forward to the, the election. One of the things that I'm mindful of as well is that I don't want to have then ad hoc, you know, just because we got in and there are people that made a decision before the election miss out and people get a different result after the election. So uh, we, we, you know, we have to accept that it is the government's program, that the government's played a hardball on it, uh, and we'll see where we're at, you know, closer to the election in terms of if, if there is anything that we can do. But certainly I think that the sort of planning outcomes moving forward are areas that we are particularly concerned about, and that's been looked at in committee at the moment. So just, just I, think, I don't know if you got the questions before the, the meeting. No. Got on the, okay. Uh, Not that I'm aware of. Oh, we did say that. I didn't say that. Okay. The, the, um, some of the questions are, mm. what would you change if you got into government? If, yep. you, if you have the decision making, I, I appreciate you, you, you we, we, both of us gave evidence to that, yeah, yeah. To that, that subcommittee. Sure, yeah. Uh, and um, we appreciated the, the, mm. the, the attention and yeah. uh, that you gave to, to our, to our um, submissions. <coughs> but the government isn't, isn't going to shift. This well, the government, government isn't going to shift. shift. Uh, uh, will, will you shift on any of these? Because well, we, we, we feel we, like we haven't been looked after. No, I understand. Uh, my answer to you is we may. Uh, as I said, at the time that this was debated... What, what, um, what might you do? Well... There are, there are a number of things that we might do. I think that we might say to people who are still in their homes, who are particularly older people, you know, you can stay. Uh, well, they, they, they can stay for five years now. Well, it's they just can. that they're, they're screwed because yeah, they're, they're getting offered a price last year. We, we, if the prices on the inner north have gone up 10 or 15% mm -hmm. since last. We're still in our house. We know we're, we're 10 yeah. or 15% worse off now, and mm -hmm. the anxiety is even more uh, sure. because we can't, there's, there's no just. Mm -hmm. Very little on the market. Yeah. I'm loath to sort of lock in exactly what we're going to do. I mean, there are we're sort of open to any of those 13 differences, points of difference on the legislation. We're open to some will have passed their use by date. Well, it's just, it's just we feel like without any commitments, you're not you're not actually going to do anything. Sure. No, I accept that. Um, <laughs> we we are looking at exactly what it is that we would do that is different. But so, I so can you give a commitment that you will have? Specific policies before you go to the next. Election. Yes, we will. We will. You'll know. You'll know what it is that we will do that is different from the government program, depending on exactly where that's at. Because you know that there are a lot of unknowns. Like we didn't know how many people were going to sign up to the program. What's going to happen with house prices? Whether it's going to be what the response was going to be to variation three four three, and that's in committee at the moment. So what we'll do is once we are comfortable that we are in a position to do so, we'll make announcements. We won't necessarily do it all at once. Once we, we are confident, as I said, for example, about older Canberrans, we'll be able to make announcements progressively. Okay, yeah. but what, sorry, I'll just, just finally... Oh, what I did want was a Board of Inquiry <coughs> to report so we could then get the information from the Board of Inquiry that was somewhat apolitical, if that makes sense, so we'd, we'd have a better grasp of exactly what it is that needed to be done it looks like the government's trying to stop that from happening, so that's been one of the impediments. Oh, thanks for the opportunity to ask questions, Jeremy. Um, I guess taking up the issue of people who want to stay in place and ageing in place, mm. um, I live in Braddon and we bought 35 years ago when no one wanted to live in a grumpy old house in Braddon. <laughs> um, fortunately that's changed. Um, but we don't want to move. Um, and what we discovered is that you can have a block of, say, 1,500 square metres um, and you can have a house that was built a long time ago and it's 128 square metres and on that block you can only build another house that's 90 square metres and you can't get a dual occupancy. Mm. So for a lot of people that moved into the area at the same time as we did, they're wanting to stay in place. But for them to stay in place, they want to downsize. They're on big blocks that it would make sense mm. to have a dual occupancy. But for that to be cost effective, they need to be able to separately title those. Now, we had a period a while ago where that was possible. We've now got a current period where 
you can buy a massive, monstrous house on that property. Mm. But you can't actually have two separate houses and allow people to remain in there and to be able to afford to do so and to be able to have a second residence that would enable other people that want to live in that community and stay in that community to do the same thing. Mm. So I guess I'm asking, um, will the Liberal Party make a commitment to look at that issue of um, infill in a mm. way that is not talking six-storey mm. or whatever um, apartments, there's enough of those in Bradham, but is talking about enabling people who are getting, I think, 22 next year, um, who are getting older to be able mm. to stay in place, but to be able to do so in a way that's... Yeah, well, we are looking at that. So the, the discussion about the Mr Fluffy unit titling, uh, our response has been, well, let's take this as an opportunity to look at unit titling. So rather than just look at Mr. Fluffy in isolation, so uh, you know the question is, well, should we um, should we expand the ability for people to have dual occupancy uh, or not? Because we we don't want just an ad hoc Mr. Fluffy response. If dual is on a certain size of land are appropriate, well, let's do it. Uh, so we are actively looking at that now. And we understand the arguments. I'm going to interfere yeah, very quickly. I guess just related to what you were saying about the monstrous houses, it's a very odd setup where. Let's say, let's just say a thousand square meters. Mm -hmm. If you know, if you weren't on a corner block, I think at most it's like thirty percent. So say mm -hmm. if you had dual occupancy, it's effectively three hundred square meters, I think. Mm -hmm. But if you just want to build one house, it's five hundred square meters. Mm -hmm. So ironically, you're not encouraging people to downsize. You're actually encouraging people to upsize yeah. because you actually get rewarded for that. Yeah. Anyway. No, I don't we, we, we've heard this, we understand these, and we, we are looking at these issues um, mm. actively. Uh, you know, we want to see, I suppose, infill done in the right way, and that's a way of doing it. We just have McMansions popping up all over the place, and mm. it's that 50% plot ratio that means you can get mm. some pretty big things. So. Mm. Anyway. Jeremy, um, first of all, thanks for coming. Um, it's really good to see a Liberal Party uh, representative compared to a lot of the um, Labor representatives in the ACT. Uh, we see a little bit of Steve Gospot uh, mm. locally, with um, comes out late with coffee sessions, and it's just good to see you here tonight. I've got many questions, I'm not going to ask them all. Um, I suppose in some respects I'm a long-term Canberra resident who sees it from two angles. Went to university here in the 70s, Worked here till 1990, bought in Watson, 1980, lived away for 15 years, came back 2006 to the same house we bought in, um, uh, in 1980. Now, my feeling is that for all the development that's gone on in ACT, Canberra is not a better place to live. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, transport yeah. conditions are poor. Yes. Um, mm. It's hard to get around. It's not as nice as it used to be. Mm. Just my view. Many questions. One, what proportion of government income is generated by the land development agency? Uh, probably too much is probably the answer. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the uh, is. Look, it's <coughs> it depends how you want to quantify it, but in terms of land sales, is that what you're talking about in development or land sales fees? I don't yeah. know what the land I, I, without the budget in front of me I wouldn't be able to give you the amount, but certainly uh, the land development agency has become a sort of uh, it's huge. Uh, it's a it's a growing area of government. It now seems to control and run half the city. Uh, so we we have been looking at this with interest and it seems that very few people are happy with the land development agency, be it you know your average punter, or be it people who are trying to build, or people trying to develop. Uh, it seems to be having some pretty perverse outcomes there in terms of its actual revenue and how much it's getting in. I mean, principally that through land sales and by the fact that the government through the LDA is doing a lot of developments. Uh, and you know, when the the government is in the business of you know, essentially owning land, selling land, doing the development, 
it then creates outcomes which are controlled by government and aren't necessarily the best outcomes um, you know, in terms of delivery of land. And I think the land supply, as an example, has been a, a failure in this town. And that's why people are moving out of Canberra and moving down to uh, uh, Tralee and Gugong and uh, Jerobomba and elsewhere. So. I, I think there are many who would agree with, with that point. Mm. But what would you do about it? Mm. Because you'll probably be elected. Mm. Um, the, 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 the development business has to stop simply because we're going to run out of land. Mm. You can divide the box down. But <laughs> development is a bit like a Ponzi scheme. Well, 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 the, well, the lives to well, I think in the, time. The, there's there's a couple of parts to this, and this is you know any budget is uh, you know what revenue you get and what you spend, uh, and this is part of why we have concerns with some of the expenditure from this government. Now, uh, what we would like to see is that the need to keep selling land, doing developments through the government. Uh, that sort of desperate need to keep expanding everywhere and the civics a case in point. Uh, that you know the West Basin development, the city to the lake, isn't about beautification of the city, it's all about trying to sell the land. Um, now, if if you're spending a billion dollars on the first phase of the tram and you've got five or six phases to go, you're gonna to need to sell a lot of land just to pay for it. <coughs> so th there's two sides to the equation, I suppose, is getting the spending under control and you know, we're, we're, we're very invested in spending in health and education and local services, but there are some projects that we think, well, that's a step beyond. Uh, so that's, that's part of the equation. Uh, with the LDA as well, I think that, you know, there are, if we are going to do, and I've got no problems with land supply. If people want properties and want land, they should be able to do it. And people in Canberra can't get land, so they're going elsewhere. Uh, it doesn't all need to be done by the LDIs. There are some very good uh, developers in this town that can do this as well. As I said, many other questions, but mm. that have to be another type. But one more. Mm. Do you know from what source, what funds, the light rail is proposed to be funded? Will it be government borrowings? Or will it be sort of a well, good question, because we're not being told. Uh, ultimately, you'll pay for it one way or the other. Uh, so, at this stage with the, the sort of PPP type model, uh, I suppose that there is a, a view that the, the capital will be provided up front by the consortium, and then we pay, pay it off over 30 years. So they then charge us $100 million a year to, to run like right, because it's the paying off the debt and the the operational cost. But the <coughs> the sale of all the Northbourne Hi Carol. Thank you. There you go. Uh, the sale of all of the Northbourne flats and the public housing. Part of that asset recycling, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we're but the, the sale of that four hundred million dollars of assets meant that the federal government is going to give the ACT sixty million dollars. Now we've spoken to the federal government, they give us sixty million dollars for another project. It's not wedded to lock rail. <coughs> Uh, but if that's the case, then that money has to be up front. So we're not getting the answers from the government. So the answer is there are a number of ways it could be funded. It could be funded using the asset sales uh, in part. It could be all put on the never never and you know, you'll know you pay for it for 30 years to come at an amount of I don't know, 100 million a year is an estimate. Uh, we're not being provided with those answers. Have they changed the guidelines for government borrowing? My understanding is that <laughs> so we just have other questions. Yeah. Sorry, right. sorry, Leon. Well, just on just on that though, if there are further questions, I'm happy to take them offline. You know, and if people have a particular issue they want to come and see me about, or it's better directed to one of my chat <coughs> ministers, we're very happy to keep the conversation going. No, that's good. Thanks. Um, yeah, back in 2012, the Planning and Land Authority created a new legislative instrument, uh, created new district and suburb precinct maps created new district and suburb precinct codes and created a new development code. Mm. They used their power under the Planning and Development Act to deem that they were technical amendments, which means that they can do that without consulting with the Minister or the Legislative Assembly or the public. Mm. 
Will you allow them to do those sorts of things in future without consultation? Well, I, you know, I, I'm of the view that decisions should be made by the Parliament where they can be possibly. And the, the reason is that we are representative. That ultimately bureaucrats can make decisions and there's no kickback on them. There's no, yeah, there's, there's no feedback loop. There's a big feedback loop for me. It's called, you know, vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I do believe that politicians, you know, they're sort of talking about get, you know, politics out of planning. Well, yeah, but the problem is this is about you telling me what you think. And if I'm then divorced from the decision making, that's problematic. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'd have to say I'm not specifically across the detail of what you're presenting, but what I would say is that I am more of the view that ministers uh, and the Assembly should be involved in making decisions or being aware of decisions uh, where it's appropriate to do so and that uh, we don't have a situation where, because ministers are so busy or for whatever reason it is, that bureaucrats are making significant decisions that impact on people's lives, uh, for which they are pretty much unaccountable. Uh, so that, that's a, a view I have, and I think that the decision that was made by the Assembly to expand, so that, you know, at the moment you've got six ministers with... I mean, I'm the Leader of the Opposition, Shadow Minister for Health, Shadow Attorney General, Shadow Minister for Police, and uh, Shadow Minister for Veterans Affairs. And, you know, it's, that's not that unusual. You have been to <coughs> Yeah, <laughs> but you know, you, you've got to have a situation where, where decisions are made by people who are accountable to the people that they represent. Is that it's a sort of philosophical approach, I suppose? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. thanks. Uh, my question goes on from the, the development um, uh, points you were making. Uh, I'm president of the Turner Residents Association, and we've been fighting uh, draft variation 309, which is now been passed. Uh, whereby the bus interchange in Civic was moved to Parkland in Turner so that the original bus interchange could be sold to, uh, to the ANU as a development bus site. Layover, I think you meant. <coughs> bus layover, sorry. Yes. Mm. So now, now we've, we've lost some Parkland in Turner for that. Uh, we, we, as a resident association, are very concerned that green space, particularly the, um, the green corridor, Mm. Uh, along Solomon's Creek is being attacked mm. this way. And this isn't the first um, attempt mm. at that. There's been, over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been four or five other um, mm. attempts to take bits of the park uh, for mm. urban infrastructure. Um, as part of the um, submission from the government for this, they also did, a um, uh, to buy us off, I think, a, uh, a landscape plan for the whole of the parkland, and they put that on in the documents with the DB309 when they presented it to the community. Now, that, they haven't made a commitment to um, implementing that landscape plan. I'm hoping that you could uh, do that because we feel that we've been misled. We've sure. been, we've, uh, the yeah. bus labour came with the plan that it was presented with. Right. I, uh, have you got any? Thoughts on this? Yeah, well, what I would say is that there's an election coming up next year, and it's a good opportunity for you to uh, go to politicians of all sides and get commitment. So, so that, that's what I'm. I'm, that, I'm that, yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, I, well, I'm, I'm not going to make an election announcement on on that tonight. That's for sure. But, uh, can, can you write it down as a um, as, as something to consider? Well, yeah, look, flip me through. Uh, Flip me through the, the video. On the digital. <laughs> <laughs> uh, flip me through the. I know that's why I'm not making any commitments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you flip through the details of what it is, what it is, and I'll, I'll either deal with it myself or forward it on to someone to, to have a look at it. And look, we, we are obviously looking for issues and ideas, and uh, where, where we can make commitments that are important for local communities. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather come up at the next election with the ideas that have been generated from the, the, the community rather than something I've cooked up in the back room, if you know what I mean. So it, the more ideas we get from the community, the better. So okay, well, this, yeah, this was a community idea. This yeah. is a, 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 the plan, the government spent money on this plan. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know why... I'd, I'd have to look at what the commitment is. And we, we, we can always ask questions in the Assembly. I mean, if there is, a, if there is some ambiguity about what the status of a particular plan is, then we can you know, write to ministers, we can put questions on notice, we can ask questions without notice, we can try and get some clarification. 
about what the status of various plans is, and we, we're happy to do that sort of stuff. We do it all the time. Okay, thank you. Would it be a novel idea to have one planning authority? Look, I think we've got five at the moment. Yeah, we've got, we got a lot. Uh, you know, when you look at Every the, minister's well, got so. some planning. It does appear that, you know, when you, are you including the NCA in that? And, you know, housing ACT seems to be doing development they're, they're, and yeah. stuff now as well. And, you know, ACPLA and LDA and the Chief Minister's Department, uh, you know, the <laughs> EDD. So, look, it, it is really convoluted. <laughs> As a system, I mean, it, it is it is both the the process, the legislation, the the structures of government are, you know, not optimal. I think it, it's reasonable to say. Uh, but again, uh, yes, we're aware of the problem, uh, and we are looking at what our response to that is. But what we do want to do is make it simpler for people accessing government. It depends on whether they. have in, you know, constituents, just, uh, you know, yeah. everybody in the street that's concerned about a particular development application that might have gone over the road, all the way through to large-scale developers at the moment, mm -hmm. nobody's happy with and the system. And I'm a advisor minister, to be honest, sometimes, yeah. you know, you can ask a question in the Assembly and you can see them looking at each other thinking, oh, what Who's is going to answer? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a minister for planning, but, you know... It, it does strike me that this is, a, this, is a, this is a political critique that... <laughs> Uh, there are, I suppose, ministers... Andrew Barr is trying to suck everything in to control himself. It, it does seem to be a, a way of doing business that he has. I think Katie Gallagher was more of a, you know, someone that was happy that others would do their jobs and she would, you know, oversight and get involved when necessary. Andrew Barr does seem to be of the character that he wants to control it all himself. So between... Andrew, you know, you know, he's got assistant ministers now, so he can have his finger in the pie. So I think a lot of the duplication is so that if there's a particular issue, ultimately Andrew Bark is just right over the top and take control of it. So I think that's part driving the way it is. It's not the way I'd operate. I've got, I think, some very capable, good people in my uh, shadow cabinet and there'd be ministers who I'd trust and I'd be very happy for them to get on and do their job. And that's the way it should be. And then they're accountable, uh, both to me and then to the, to the public. I, I don't want to be interfering and doing other people's jobs for them. So I think that's why we've ended up where we are. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Marcus. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to come back to your point about growing the economy. Um, I think uh, you've identified one of the biggest assets that Canberra has is, in the, is intellectually a very high standard. We've got some great institutions here. Mm. Um, and you have mentioned you know, your changes to the lease variation charge, but that's more about sort of general development. Do you have anything specific be targeted to unlocking that potential we have in, in the sort of high standard of intellectual capability. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess that's sure. the question. Uh, what I would say is that we are, we will be making announcements right. in due course, so I, I don't want to sort of yeah, reveal sure. them now. But there are, there are a lot of institutions in town that I think that we, uh, what we want to see is the work that they're doing commercialised. Yep. Now, there are, it's not to say that there isn't good work going on in this space, and I recognise it with the Canberra Innovation Network, mm -hmm. the Griffin Accelerator, uh, and so on. There's a, there's, a, there's a body of work happening, Canberra Business Point, and so on. But there are people out there currently, uh, and supported by government, in part, I think, uh, my point would be, I think, that there is more that can be done in this space. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, you know, part of it's a cultural change as well. Uh, I think that we want to get the, the good ideas that are developed in the CSIRO, and you, or elsewhere, commercialise and how can we assist in that process. But I'm also very strongly of the view that <coughs> government shouldn't be the one doing it. Uh, that I think that particularly when it comes to innovation, you know, if government is trying to put their, trying to run innovation, it'd be a, you know, a problem. Mm. Uh, it's got to be naturally bottom up. And I think, you know, you can see it sometimes with the best, you know, when you get back to planning, that some of the stuff that you've seen happening in Brandon, because it's organic and the unplanned, it's creative, it's good. Uh, Nishi, perhaps, you know, some of the stuff in New Acton, but when government comes, comes in and tries to control, it, it doesn't necessarily create the best outcomes. So, yes, I think the support would be provided, but I think also it's about uh, where we can, some deregulation and, uh, you know, looking at what the taxation is in that space as well. Marianne? Oh, thank you. I'm Marianne, I'll be promised. I'm here. Um, 
I was really pleased to hear you say that you wanted to grow the economy and build a city. Mm. I guess I would take great comfort if you could possibly grow the economy in a sustainable way. And that relates to building the city because I often wonder, I've lived in Canberra for 25 years now and I still think it's one of the best kept secrets in Australia. And I'd really like to see capitalising the, the natural resources as well as the intellectual resources, mm. the cultural resources, mm. the environmental resources we have in the area. I'm not just confining it to Canberra, but also the capital region itself. Mm. Um, and I would like to see us much more take a higher profile in um, Australia's, and I don't mean, obviously we've got the federal government here, that's, that's fine, but I mean, mm. in terms of visitation, tourism, um, all those energies that can come from those sorts of activities. Sure. But, you know, how do we get that brand, that Canberra brand, out to attract sure. people, inter both nationally and internationally? Yeah, no, I, I think that the, I have to be honest, the CBR thing, the, the luggage tag CBR, you know, it's a Twitter handle, it's all funky and cool, but I'm not sure that anyone's going to come exactly. and visit Canberra because, of, you know, they see CBR. Uh, I, I'm not convinced by that. Uh, what I would say is that we have a number of really good events that we can put on here. I think there are some things that we can, you know, capitalise on, and that's not normal, that's not new. That's been done before, but there are some of the, you know, like the Masters uh, exhibition, but there are, we've got these national institutions, and I think we have to play to our strengths, to be honest. You know, <coughs> people are not going to come necessarily to visit the Legislative Assembly, but they will come to visit Parliament. And I know this firsthand. hand over there. Feel free to come and visit us. <laughs> It's very frustrating, isn't it, Caroline? You know? Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the assembly again? <laughs> but you know, with all those national institutions, and I think that you know, uh, promoting some of those unique characteristics that we have. I mean, there are, there are a lot of people who want to go to the beach and you know, do that side of it. But if you if you want to do things that are cultural, I think we do have those national institutions that we. They're a massive resource for us. Absolutely. We've got to be realistic about that. But they need joining up in some way. Well, they, they do, and I think it's a coordinated campaign, tourism campaign. And again, you know, it's about supporting, recognising that, you know, with, with tourism dollars, every job that's created through tourism, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is a real value add. And it's not something that's just internal. Because, you know, if, you, if you're doing building or if you're doing things that are just servicing the federal government, uh, it, to an extent, it's internal churn. It's good. But if you're creating more people coming into the city, that's real growth. Uh, that, that's a real potential. We see, we see the tourism sector as important. Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about a convention centre uh, and capitalising on that. And again, I'd love to see uh, business get involved in that. Uh, we, you know, the federal, the, the ACT government has said they'll provide land with support. That we've, been, we've pushed pretty hard on that, on a convention centre. But again, I, I think that that's an area where I'd like to see uh, business grasped that opportunity and <coughs> run with it uh, to, to bring people in. Uh, a, a tourism idea that you know is being presented and we are reviewing and you know is the new casino that's being developed. Uh, now it does bring in a lot of people who want to spend a lot of money. Now I'm not sure we want to be knocking that back. So we've we got to be, you know, uh, we, we can't be too precious either that if there are people that want to invest in Canberra. Uh, we've got to look at all of those different options. I thought you had a casino up on the hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just numbers going around and around. Yeah. But, yeah, a couple of, just a couple of things. The first one is with the rates again. Mm. Um, I've brought it up before. Um, the rates that are collected for commercial property in this town mm. is out of proportion to the rates that are collected for residential. I mean, I've got a block of land, I pay $30,000 a year general rates. Mm. If that same block was a house <coughs> block, I'd be paying a third at the most. Mm. And I think someone should look at the how commercial businesses mm. are paying exorbitant rates compared to a thing. Yeah. It's just, that's a comment. But the one I want to bring up, it's just struck again, um, I quote for jobs. I can't quote for ACT government jobs because I'm not a preferred mm. tenderer. But I quoted for a job because the people wanted me to do 
and it was for an ACT government building. I can't say where it is at the moment. Someone else got the job. They quoted eight times the price I quoted for the same job in excess of $170,000 to renovate two kitchens in an ACT government building. Mm. I think someone should look at this tendering process mm. because it's not the amount of money as such, it's the taxpayer is mm. paying for this sort of exorbitant thing mm. and this particular job. People have been given a job to project manage two renovations to two kitchens in a building, you don't need a project manager, you just want someone in there to, to build it or to renovate it. I think someone should look at what's going on. I won't say that someone could be paid in the back pocket, I won't say that, um, but something is wrong. And this is only a small job, right? Now what goes on with the major jobs in this town that ten people are tendering to the government and the prices are just over the top. I think someone should look at what's going on and who's making the money for mm. doing jobs that are... Well, as I... We, um, we've got some concerns with procurements and the way it's done, but one, one, uh, one piece of legislation that we brought in recently requires people with contracts, and I think it's... The amount, I can't remember, it's ten or twenty-five thousand, but it's a, it, it, it's now all reported on a website. So what it does is it, it gives us visibility of who's getting, who's getting the money from the ST government um, procurements. Right. So we, we've brought that in to give greater visibility uh, to where the money's going. Because you know I make no allegation or suggestion that there's any impropriety, but obviously if you've got people handling money, right. uh, where's it going? Who's getting it? Uh, and then what decisions are linked to that. And I think that the more open that that can be, uh, the, more, the less likely you're going to have corruption or... Uh, you know, I'm not happen. saying there's corruption. No. So we've, we've brought that in. the process and... too um, <coughs> of everyone that wants to get involved in this tendering yeah. type system, mm. they all want to do their little bit. Well, when you add all these little bits up, mm. really one business can do some of these projects. It doesn't need six different businesses to come in and put all their pricing on, etc., etc. Yeah, so I just, to. yeah, no. Just there's also there's also a lot of it's local businesses, and you know, there's there are quite a bit of there's quite a bit of infrastructure work going on the ACT courts, the new uh, hospital, and local businesses are missing out now. You know, you've got to make sure that we're getting good return, you know, good investment for the ACT taxpayer, but. You know, you've got locally based businesses employing local Canberrans that continually miss out, then what's going to happen is those businesses are just going to shut their doors uh, or they're moving off into state. So, you know, we've got to make sure as well that I think that, that we're aware of the impact on local businesses through the yeah. um, it's, it's possible, it seems. Uh, well, one of the people was a bit concerned recently about Lionel Mobile. And but moving beyond that, it sort of became apparent that it's possible in the ACT to sort of go to the government and say, I want some land to do something, and over time turn it into something else. And essentially you have all these groups getting land for free and becoming property developers. Mm -hmm. And it's not just one place, it's happening all over Canberra. This strikes me as a as a as a <coughs> It just shouldn't happen. Have you got any insight into why this is occurring and whether it should? Well, you know, I suppose that there will be occasions where, you know, things go wrong. And I think that it's really important that the community are engaged. And that's one example. Tilopia Park's another one, which happened recently, that we, um, we fought against and uh, stopped the government from doing it. So, look, ultimately, the government of the day, uh, either through its own initiative or people coming to it, will, will have decisions to make about use of land, uh, and sometimes it will be out of touch with what the community expects or wants. And I think that that's why you know it's very important that government consults properly, that government engage properly. Uh, that you know it's great as I said at the beginning that community councils are active, 
and provide the sort of response that's required and that, that politicians are sensitive to what the community's needs and expectations are. Uh, but you can't, in essence, stop that from happening uh, because a lot of the outcomes are very good. Uh, sometimes they're not and you know, I think that that's why it's back to the earlier question that you've got to make sure that the various stages the politicians are engaged to make sure that uh, the community's concerns are addressed and responded to. But consultation ultimately has to be genuine, has to be, has to incorporate what the community has input it. And it, there'll never be one voice, I mean there's always disparate voices and different opinions. Uh, but I don't think there's any silver bullet and you can't just say, well, look, we're not going to have any proposals put to government about use of land. No, this is more about concessional leases that are given at yeah. almost no cost and then, uh, yeah. then you get development like uh, the sure. Brumbies or um, yeah. the Raiders in Civic. So yeah. effectively, if you get land for any purpose in Canberra, you, you go there with the story, I want to do some sport, and that's a really good thing or something like that, but it always <laughs> ends up turning into something else. And, and a lot yeah. of money gets made by people along the way. Sure, and look, I, I think that you know this is when you know we're talking about lease variation and so on that we've we've said it for the town centre and civic centre, uh, and civic. Uh, what we don't want is where there has been a session lease and it's there for community purpose and so on. That then that's just used as a uh, as a reason to build units or build flats, and it's just about making money. Now, often. What it's about is that there might be an organisation that's got a concessional lease, and it might be a golf club or a bowls club, or it might be any organisation, they're struggling. But and should, it's, they to make given, them. But shouldn't they be given the money through a government grant rather than. Well, this back, back door. Back door. Yeah. Because, yeah. because sure. essentially they get millions of dollars for enough for where other people who may or have a. They're not given a chance at it. So just sure. because you've got some deal or you go and speak to you've got a friendly politician. You get millions, and everyone else doesn't. Well, the, I suppose there's a balance, uh, and sometimes there are organisations which are providing a real community service, a community asset, as such. And, and maybe they should and, get the money, but not not through a sort of backdoor. Well, product. I suppose ultimately as well that you know if there's a, if there is a solution where a community organisation can you know do something on their site uh, that is sympathetic with the local environment, that you know broadly has to support the community that then makes that local organisation sustainable and then doesn't cost the rate payer, you know. I mean, I, I don't think government wants to be in the business of doling out money to organisations that, you know, a, a golf club or a bowls club or whatever well, it might be. What's the difference between well. doling out money and doling out land? It's, it's, same, it's, the same well, it's exactly the same thing. It, it's not entirely the same thing. I mean, the point, the point would be that if that land is sitting there and isn't being used, that, you know, if the government's getting revenue from somewhere else then, has to either sell land somewhere else or increase rates or whatever it is. But it uh, so property development rather than, I mean, you've got sporting clubs building daycare centres. What's it got to do with sport? Well, the government could build a daycare centre sure. and then provide the funds, well, take those funds and, 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 allocate, and allocate them as well, they Well, efficiently. it could, but also I think that, you know, there, there would be a view that you know, government should be doing everything. You know, we're not in a position where the government runs everything and then doles money out to, you know, to sports clubs. And other people didn't. Sure. So and that's when I think it's got to be considered that if, if a community organisation wants to change their lease course so that they can do something to make themselves sustainable, it's got to be looked at. It's got to be... It's, it can't just simply be about making money for someone. It's got to be invested into that organisation that one would expect is providing something good in the community. So I'm not, I'd have to say I'm not philosophically opposed to it. It's got to be right, it's got to be, the community's got to broadly support it, but if we're in a position where we say nobody's allowed to change their lease clause, they've got to just stay as they are, but if, if an organisation's running out of money, the government's just going to give them money. That's not a solution either. It's what you're doing already, because if somebody, if you're given the land, you effectively just gave them the money. Well, I do think that there is a difference because if an organisation then can, through sale or lease a property or whatever it might be, make sure that they are viable as an entity, uh, then there is no cost to the ACT budget, uh, in essence, whereas otherwise that organisation goes bankrupt. 
But it's basically land that, that, that they're getting. So whether you give them cash or give the land, it's the same thing. Well, you could have sold the land or <coughs> the daycare center yourself and given them some portion of the money. Well, certainly, but I suppose then the decision is that, you know, does the government get into the business of <coughs> selling the land, building a daycare centre, and then giving the money from the daycare centre back to that organisation? Or is it's it done by the... It's far more than just having a word with your mate as the local politician to get some free land. And, well, I'm sure you when these things... all organisations sure. to apply for that money. Yeah, well, it's just... I, I just can't imagine that this could even be considered as... as, as, as acceptable. It's sort of NDOB territory. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I do understand what you're saying, and it's got to be done the right way, but I'm not saying that, you know, there are situations where I think it's, it is appropriate, and I think that, you know, where you do have a community organisation that is providing a, an asset to the community, uh, but because, for whatever reason, uh, they're on a, you know, they're on a space and it's, it's difficult for them to, to sustain themselves, but by a... Uh, viable and you know ethical to use that word uh, use of that land that they could become sustainable I don't have an objection to that now I do have an objection if it's all about just making money for someone but you know the ones that I've seen the least variations that have come through you know I, I'm not aware of any where it's just simply about you know out there to make a profit you know most of these community organizations that are out there you know working hard working on a shoestring and a lot of them are some of them. Some of them, yeah, but we are. <laughs> I'm just sorry. Sure. Well, there you go, yeah. yeah. The, ra the Raiders get $5 million a year from the government just for turning up to, to play matches. They don't need government that much. They don't need the government to give them discount rates on deconcessionalisations. Well, as I said, each on their merit. Each on their merit. Yeah. yeah. But, but you know, the, the, you know, the... I think we suspect a lot of have much merit. Sure, and I, I accept that. You know, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, and I think that any of these, any proposal, you know, must have a genuine consultation with the local community, because it can't just be an endless case of just taking open space. That's for sure, and we don't support that. Okay, two more questions. There. Um, the ST oh, government. Sorry, um, the ST government um, at the moment seems to have a very enthusiastic. Um, policy towards renewable energy um, and that seems to be in a large way driven by um, business participating in partnership with government which is motivated by um, a government goal, aspiration if you will. Um, would the Liberals look at significantly altering that if they were to take leadership? Uh, look, I know is the answer to that in terms of what's existing. I mean, we're not going to uh, with their contracts and so on, and a lot of these uh, of solar or wind uh, have been set up with contracts, you know, will be, will be locked into those. Uh, I am uh, mindful of the costs of some of this stuff, uh, that again, you know, I think that uh, being environmentally sustainable, uh, you, know, re you know, renewable energy is a, is a good space to be in, but in balance. You know, the government's ambition to go to 100% renewables. Uh, again, I am concerned about some of the costs with this. We need to look at what is affordable, what is achievable. Uh, so it's not just the targets, but the time frame as well. So some of the costs are somewhat hidden, uh, and we need to, I think, better understand and explore that because I'm very mindful that, uh, you know, for a lot of people, the cost of power is a major part of their household expenditure. And, you know, if power prices are going up as a result of increased renewables, as an example, we need to make sure that we've got that in balance. Uh, we can't, in a desperate attempt to get to a target, then, you know, allow electricity prices to go through the roof. So we want to have that in balance. Uh, but what I would say is that I'm, I'm supportive of renewables, uh, I think we've got to make sure we do it the right way. The solar feed-in tariff program that was put on people's roofs, uh, the estimated increase of power bills across the board is about $200 a year. It's a very poor way to do it. There's good ways to do renewables and there's bad ways to do renewables. And the solar feed-in power the tariff system that was done in what, 2009, and the contracts that were signed uh, with the residents that got involved, you know, to put a solar 
a ray on your roof at that stage was about $20,000. So who could do it? People who had $20,000 cash. It, so it excluded a whole bunch of people. So you know, if, if you got on that scheme, you now feed into the, the grid and you make a lot of money. And there's a lot of winners out of that. And meanwhile, everyone else is paying for it. So the objective, the intent was noble, I guess, but the reality is that in terms of, you know, ton, a dollar per tonne of carbon, it was massively expensive. There, were, there are any number of better ways of reducing emissions than that. So it was a glamour program and it looked good and it sounded good and a feed-in tariff program and uh, as a result, we, you know, the ACT for that program is, is spending an enormous amount per tonne above what we should be. So we've got to make sure we get it right. Yeah. Okay. okay, final question. Yeah. Um, having sat through um, several developments in Dixon, um, you're sitting in one controversial area in terms of Section 72. Mm -hmm. um, Mike and I just came off a meeting with the LDA um, wanting to revisit the car park at the back of the pool. Um, as a result of the temporary car park going uh, oh. back to that location, given that uh, independent now trying to develop the TAV into residential as opposed to uh, commercial. So, um, not this argument, because we've gone through two large public consultations of over 100 people. You've had um, housing stick their finger in and um, try to say that 800 uh, units down to 200 was a, a win. <laughs> when it's actually gone from 160 to 200. Um, for the future, mm. for the Liberal side of the equation, mm. it fell off the radar when the Greens were opposed and that was better funding for councils to actually interact with the government mm. on a regular basis <coughs> and actually have resources so that people can actually be paid to research mm. where the DA process actually fails. Mm. And so, are you committed to actually working with the councils to find a better model mm. so that the councils and the community associations that mm. feed into those councils better relate to government? Well, absolutely we see the community councils and all the community associations as an invaluable resource. And, you know, you'd, you'd be aware of the Yarralama development. Uh, Steve Dospot, who lives in Yarralama, then worked very hard with the Yarralama Residents Association and as a result, what was an unacceptable development. Uh, now, you know, we, we moved a motion in the Assembly calling the government to make a significant number of changes, done in consultation with the community through the association, and now the amended plan through the LDA is also almost word to word what we proposed. But a lot of that came from consultation with the YRA. So what I'd say is that uh, we want to make sure that uh, community councils and associations are uh, have a voice. Now, there's a number of ways to do that, but certainly they need to be uh, respected, resourced, uh, and acknowledged by government as part of of the process. And it strikes me that there are a lot of very smart people with time on their hands to an extent, which is a great resource. Exactly. You know what I mean? They're, they're close to the community. They're close to the ground. They, you know, some of the submissions you see from members of the community and residents association are just amazing. But they're highly underfunded and they're, <laughs> done, and they're done out of free time. Yeah. And so in terms of better resourcing the councils, sure. um, that's more than <coughs> that I was asking. See, at the moment there's a $15,000 that mm. goes to each council. Mm. That's a drop in the ocean in terms of trying to get mm. uh, proper resourcing for research to be done. So yeah. where, where do you see that going? Well, what I'll do is I'll take that on notice, shall I? I hear you. Um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to engage with all the community councils. Uh, you know, as I said, there's an election coming up next year. We don't want to be out. We don't want to be out community councils by the Greens, do we? So, uh, You'd have to try all that. <laughs> well, we, uh, you know, we, we want to stay close to the community. Uh, we see you and all the other community councils as an important part of that. As I said, we won't always agree, but that's sometimes a good thing. You know, if community councils and government agree on everything, then someone's probably not doing their job because, you know, government's got to do things and community council's got to express what the community thinks. So, uh, I, I hear Lane and Claire, mate, and we, we've, we've had discussions about how we can best support community councils, but 
again, you know, this isn't the forums it necessarily make. But well done, you know, you've got to put the pressure on a fault issue. There's no pressure yet. <laughs> 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 yes. That can obviously that. And I embrace that, you know, I acknowledge that. That's that that is the democratic process and for all its faults and its warts and you know, you saw some of it in action last night. You know, if you've, uh, you know, politicians are not representing the people, and people don't feel the politicians are listening to them, uh, then we'll get the boot. Uh, and so that's the way it works. You know, that's, that's the beauty of democracy, isn't it? That's why Caroline's here, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, no, that's <laughs> Experiment. I, uh, it, it's a city week, so, <laughs> and as you can appreciate, late night was quite a late night yeah. for me, so I've got an uh, early start of the city week uh, in the morning. But what